just have a brief question, but before I ask, I want to ask this question. And that is, did, do I understand rightly that you believe that the King James Bible does not have any errors in it? Yeah, I believe it's without proven error. That is correct. I'm not going to, this is just to, so that people understand my question. No, I don't mean you showing off. I asked the question. Uh, okay, so I'm going to. What's the next question? The next question is, um, okay. In Acts chapter 12, verse 4, it, uh -huh. it mentions Easter. Yeah. And according to this book here, just so everybody knows, in Babylon, yeah, but that's Easter not the is the worship of Ishtar, which uh -huh. is the Nineveh god. Anyway. So what's the question? And the question is, is well, I'm getting to it. Um, and according to this, binds. Yeah, but what's for, the question? For us who don't know Greek, uh, I'm, I'm getting to it. Oh, um, well, you sure have a long way of getting to a question. Well, well, you know, if I asked me for a question, I could shoot him down in two seconds. Give me, give me a question. I'm going to give it to you. Give it to me. Okay, here it comes. Anytime you're ready. <laughs> okay. Um, since the Greek word is not, according to Vines, yeah. uh, Easter, but yeah. Passover. That isn't the to, Greek, that's the English. This, you quote the English, not the Pardon Greek. me? You quoted the English, not the Greek. But, but the King James is the one without the error, right? Yeah, so that's right. Okay, so... So what's the question? Okay, so the question is, since since it's translated Easter, but in uh, the Textus Receptus, it's Passover, how do you explain that? That's oh, not I, a mistake. I have a seat in the first place, and the Textus Receptus is not Passover. The Textus Receptus is a Greek text, and there's no such Greek word as Passover. So what he's actually talking about is a Greek word, and the Greek word looks like this. And this word is not uh, is not Passover. It's Pascha. And if you put that thing transliterated, you'd have this. Like that. And from that thing there, you get the Passover as the Passion Week, like that. And the word is generally translated into English, not the Receptus, which is Greek but generally translated Passover. Now the problem comes up, why in the King James Bible in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 didn't they translate it as Passover? Instead they translated it as Easter. And the, and the problem is why? And before you get into that thing there, you ought to get old Martin Luther. Martha, Martin Luther really do it. I mean, Martin Luther give it this. Every time it shows up. Every time the word Passover shows up, Martin says Easter. Easter. Every time. And the reason why that is because Martin Luther is translating into German, and Martin Luther figures, well, these Germans always associate the Passover with Easter, so I'll call it Easter, which he did. Now the question is why. All right, take your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 12, and we'll see why. Verse 1, Acts 12, 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Who's Herod? He's a Roman king. Verse 2, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews. Now, you got two groups there. you got Romans, you got Jews. It pleased the Jews also. He proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, regardless of how Pascha was going to be translated, you still knew it was the Passover. How did you know it was the Passover? Because he said, then were the days of unleavened bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Feast of Passover. So I already told you one time what it was. For a Jew. Now you're going to tell what it is for a Roman. Verse 4. And when apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. What were the days of unleavened bread for Herod? They were Easter. Why? Because Romans kept the Feast of Easter and the book he showed you there, is a book called The Two Babylons by uh, Hislop, where the Babylonian goddess Ishtar is worshipped, and that's where the term Easter comes from. If you want to see it in the King James, turn to Judges chapter 2, verse 13, and you'll see the other spelling on it. Judges 2, 13. There are three spellings on this uh, Babylonian goddess. Uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 13. And in Judges 2.13, she's called Ashtoreth, like that. Now that woman, it's a woman. Eastern Ishtar, named after Ashtoreth, she's a Babylonian goddess, 
And she has a very peculiar title. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 44, which a Roman picks up immediately. Roman chapter, oh, there's nothing like a King James Bible to straighten out a Greek lexicon. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. Here's a Jeremiah chapter 44. Here's a Jeremiah, and he's uh, talking to the, the Jews. And in Jeremiah chapter 44, 25, he says this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken to your mouths, and fulfill with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows, we have vowed, to burn incense to what? The Queen of Heaven. Isn't that a peculiar thing? Verse 18. For since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. Verse 19. And we burn this incense to the Queen of Heaven. So that woman has a title. And she's called the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. She's a Babylonian false goddess, and she's a woman. The Germans call her the Lorelei. And the Scandinavians call her the L woman. Well, she's called, she's called Venus in Roman mythology. She's called Diana in Syrian theology. And the Catholics have a term for her. They call her Mary. And that old Jewish maiden that that angel made that announcement to is no more connected with that Babylonian god than Teeny Tim is connected with Larry's uncle. (laughs) They're not the same kind. They're not in the same bracket together. All right, so this Roman here is worshiping a Babylonian goddess named Ishtar, and her feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread for Jews. But to him, that thing's Easter. Well, how'd this uh, Roman get hung up for this thing? All right. You know who Herod was? I mean, his family tree. He's an Edomite. You gotta get that from Josephus. He's a, he's a Roman governor, but he's, he's connected with Edom. It's a long way around, but here it goes. Revelation 17. Revelation 17 in one hand, and, um, Genesis 14 in the other. The other boy is an Edomite, and there's no doubt about an Edomite's religion, especially if he's a Roman governor. He's going to have a Babylonian background. All right, Revelation 17. Now here's Rome, sitting up here in these seven hills, in Roman seven, in Revelation 17. All right, let's look at this thing. Verse, verse uh, 3. He carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. What is the woman? Verse 18. Read it. Verse 18. The woman which thou sawest is what? The woman of the city. You see, in the Bible gives you a figure, it tells you what the figure is. Somebody said, well, the book of uh, Revelation is apocalyptic and symbolical and figurative, and I can't understand it. You can when he tells you what it is. He said, the woman is a great city. Oh, she's sitting on this seven-headed beast. What are these seven heads? Look at verse 9. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven what? Mountains. It's a city built on seven mountains. We told you it was. Well, right, let's see about this city. Four. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. You've got to find a city built on seven mountains whose colors are purple and scarlet. Oh, I wonder what that could be. <laughs> Decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup. Drive around Seattle any place, you sign up in front of a church with a gold cup on it, and a thing like a PX, RX prescription sitting there in the thing, out uh, of gold and purple. It's just a pair like this. Is that thing sitting out there? That thing is a golden cup, most colors are purple and scarlet. And that comes from a city built on seven hills, seven mountains. What about this city? Chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 24. And her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and all that was slain upon the earth. The woman's a killer. What does she kill? She kills Christians. Look at chapter 17, verse 6. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That was the Reformation view. The Reformation view was the Roman Catholic Church was a whore, and the Pope was a man of sin. Now, you Americans are so far removed from the Reformation, you've lost your roots. 
See? And so when you talk about these things, you just get upset and disturbed. Oh, how does that can be? Well, what a thing. Well, I just can't believe that. With those good nuns down at St. Catherine's Hospital, I just love you. I don't feel happy for that. And the trouble with that thing is, you cut off with your roots, you don't know your background. Now, I believe that. These folks talk about, you know, the Phil Donahue show, you know, is that his name, Phil? I'm thinking of Al Donahue, a saxophone player, that's from some other age. <laughs> you get them, you get them mixed up after a while. But they're talking about this talk show, you know, where they talk about the issues and bravely face the issues. Nah, 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 mm-mm. No, you come here tonight, tomorrow, and you'll hear things said in this room that nobody would dare say on television morning, noon, and night. So the little, these little old buildings you see up and down this country, a little old independent Baptist church, a little buildings, you'd be surprised what's in them. <laughs> Put me in that Donahue show, I'd blow every tube in the circuit in five minutes. Boy, what are you talking about? Come on. Facing the issues, boldly discussing the issues of sexology. Ah, oh, your foot, man. I get in there and say, well, what do you think about the Catholic Church as a religious whore? <laughs> blow every tube in the place, man. But that's what they believe. That's what they believe. Now, why? look at this connection here. This Roman city is called Five Mystery Babylon. Babylon. So, now, go back to Genesis chapter 14. You know who these Babylonians are? They're down south of the Dead Sea in Eden. Many years before Christ ever shows up. Genesis 14, 1. It came to pass the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. How many of you know where Shinar is? If you ever read Genesis chapter 11, it came to pass they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and said, Go to, let us build a city and tower whose top may reach to heaven. They had a slime for mortar and, and bricks they had for stone. The Lord came down and confounded the language and called the name of that place Babel. That's Shinar. That's where this bunch is from. King of e- Elisar, Kedorim, or King of Elam, and Tidal, King of Nations, that these made war with Barak, King of Sodom, and Bersha, King of Gomorrah, and Shibna, King of Adma, and Shebim, King of Zeboim, which is the King of Bala, which is Zoar, and all these were joined together in the Vale of Sidon, which is the Salt Sea. Now, here's what you've got here in the map. You've got these Babylonians clear down here in South Palestine before Moses shows up. You've got a thing where Palestine's like this, and there's the Galilee, and there's the Jordan, and there's the uh, Dead Sea, and here's Sodom and Gomorrah, down here, and Babylon's over here. And that king of Shinar is clear down in here, where these kings fight. You know what that country's called? It's called Edom. Those Babylonians are down there before the time of Moses. They've got their religious stuff with them, and they're passing that stuff on down, when Herod shows up, he's an Edomitian usurp- usurper, an Edomite usurper to the throne set up by the Roman governor as king over the Jews at that time, so he observes Easter. That's the answer to your question. The King James is always right, the other's always wrong. What else? Nothing like a Bible to clear up a college education.